Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the study of religion and liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and also an occasional host. Before I jump into a brief explanation of the segments featured in this episode, I wanted to ask a favor of you that won't take much time at all. If you like this podcast, please swing over to iTunes and leave a five-star review and rating. Those ratings really do help our podcast, helping us gain more exposure. Also, don't forget to swing over to our website at acton.org slash line. That's A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G slash line and subscribe to this podcast. Now for a look at the episode. On the first segment of this show, I'm joined by Acton's director of research, Samuel Gregg, to touch on the historical and religious significance of Notre Dame. After that, research associate Dan Huger sits down with Acton's president, Reverend Robert Sirico, to discuss current issues in education, including some of Betsy DeVos's policies. If you want to read more about the topics in this podcast, you can check them out in our show notes, which I publish every Wednesday when our episodes release at blog.acton.org. This past Monday evening, April 15, during a renovation project of Notre Dame in Paris, the nearly 900-year-old cathedral caught fire, and within an hour, the main spire fell, later followed by most of the roof. Although the two bell towers remain standing, the loss is priceless, both for the nation of France and the Western world. Today, I'm joined by Samuel Gregg, Acton's Director of Research, to talk with me about the fire at Notre Dame. Sam, thank you for joining the podcast. It's a pleasure to be with you, Caroline. From what I hear, the main structure of Notre Dame, the two bell towers and the rose stained glass windows are still intact, but we know that there is a lot lost. And one of the facts that I thought was interesting and tragic now was that the roof that's been burned away contained original wooden beams that were installed when construction on the cathedral first began in 1160. So it was just really shocking, I think, for the whole world to see it in flames at all. I'm wondering, what was your first reaction? Well, when I first saw pictures of the cathedral burning, my thoughts immediately went to the fact that over the past year, maybe a bit longer actually, there have been a series of attacks really on a number of Catholic churches throughout France ranging from vandalism to things being stolen to just even more recently, only two or three weeks ago, one of the most famous churches in Paris, saint sulpice was the victim of a fire. Fortunately, it was put out very, very quickly, so there was very little damage done. But that was my immediate thought that, well, we don't know the causes of yet of what happened with Notre Dame. There has been this sort of series of physical attacks on a number of Catholic churches over the past year, and it had not been very much reported upon. So when I saw the cathedral burning, that was the first thought that came to my mind. The second thought that came to my mind was more or less along the lines that uh, you were just saying, that this is a building that goes back eight and a half centuries, and what we also know is that some of the material that was used to construct the original cathedral is even older than that. So there are actually concerns, for example, about whether they will be able to find trees that are big enough to be able to replicate the type of wooden structure that was in Notre Dame, because trees back then, a long time ago, almost a thousand years ago, in many places in Europe, were just much bigger, and there were many more of them. So there's concerns about whether they'll be able to find sufficient trees of sufficient size Uh, presuming they go ahead and try to replicate exactly what was there before. And I'm hearing that at this point they're estimating it's going to take upwards of 20 years to rebuild what's been lost. Well, what we're hearing also is that um, President Emmanuel Macron has been saying that he wants this project done within five years. Well, uh, anyone who spent time in Europe knows very quickly that architectural restoration, let alone rebuilding of things that have been destroyed, can take uh, quite a long period of time. And Europeans have actually been doing this for a long time, not least because war, fire, uh, uh, all sorts of things have happened that over, particularly over the past 150, 200 years that have resulted in the destruction or severe damage done to some very, very old ancient buildings. 
So the good news is that Europeans are actually very good at putting these things back together, whether it's things like the cathedral in Cologne <clears throat> or uh, the the old town of Warsaw, which was completely leveled during the Second World War, uh, or as we're seeing now, um, Notre Dame, Europeans are good at fixing these things, but it takes time. And sometimes these projects can take five years, 10 years, 20 years. So if, if I had been President Macron, I would have been a little more careful before I would have put a time limit on it. But uh, I think he is probably seeing this now as a type of legacy project for his presidency. So I'm going to read you some lines from a piece that was published in Rolling Stone yesterday. Ah, uh, yeah. They write, But for some people in France, Notre Dame has also served as a deep-seated symbol of resentment, a monument to a deeply flawed institution in an idealized Christian European France that arguably never existed in the first place. And they also quote an architecture historian at Harvard University saying that the building was so overburdened with meaning that its burning feels like an act of liberation. So my question is for you. When the cathedral was built, what did it mean? What did it symbolize for France? And why is that still important? If you look, if you know anything about French history, uh, which I suspect the authors at Rolling Stone and the other author you just quoted know very little about, to put it bluntly, what you quickly discover is that Notre Dame, the cathedral was built at the same time that the French nation was really coming into being. It's important to remember that um, France is, in many respects, the first nation state to really emerge in the world. It's the first country that really had a sense of itself as we are a nation, we are a nation state, as opposed to being simply the property of the monarch or whoever is the local duke. So when Notre Dame was being built, this was the same time when the French nation and the French state and the French monarchy started to consolidate itself as a distinct entity. So, for example, when, during the period in which Notre Dame is being built, we see things like King Philip II Augustus, who was, who his predecessors had been styled King of the Franks, he styled himself King of France. So what you see here is this very clear emergence of an identity. Now, that has a lot to do, obviously, with Christianity, even more specifically uh, with Catholicism. We shouldn't pretend that uh, there weren't other religious communities around at the time. Of course, there was a very active Jewish community, which unfortunately suffered a great deal uh, during this particular period in time, including having thousands of manuscripts burned by um, Catholic officials. So there's that sad aspect as well, the sad and terrible aspect. But we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't forget that Notre Dame begins really when France begins. And all through its history, French leaders, French politicians, French clergy have all seen it as something that's intrinsically part of what it means to be the nation of France a deeply ingrained sense in France, regardless of people's religious faith or, or not at all, that this is part of who they are. That's why, for example, Victor Hugo, who started his life as a young man, basically as a Catholic royalist, but became a Voltairian freethinker <clears throat> and more or less moved in the direction of detesting the Catholic Church, he had no hesitation at all about situating maybe his most famous novel, which of course is The Hunchback of Notre Dame, in Notre Dame Cathedral. So when someone who is as deeply hostile to Catholicism as Victor Hugo has no hesitation about locating the scenes of his most famous piece of literature in this cathedral, that tells you something about what France, uh, what, how France understands Notre Dame. It also tells you that the people who, who are writing for places like Notre Dame, uh, for um, Rolling Stone, don't know what they're talking about.
Through a lot of the press coverage, I noticed that there was a lot of grieving over the loss of the cathedral as a national symbol, which of course it is, but less mentioning of its loss as a place of worship. Where does France stand right now between Christianity and secularism? Well, it's interesting. It's interesting because over the past, I would say, 20 years, there's been a distinct revival in French Catholicism. Now, I don't mean by that that there's lots of more people going to Mass on a regular basis. But what I do mean is that Catholicism in France has more or less consolidated itself. The people who are going to church in France today are there because they really believe these things to be true. And I think that's a sort of harbinger of what's happening in Europe as a whole, that people who, especially Western Europe, people who are religious, whether they're Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, whatever, they're going and taking, going and participating in religious ceremonies because they take their faith seriously. It's no longer a question of just being culturally conformist, or this is what I do if I want to show I'm a good person, I go to church, regardless of whatever I believe. People who are going to church really believe these things. And in the case of French Catholicism, it's very clear that since the early 1980s, there's been a much stronger consolidation of what it means to be a Catholic in France today. And if you go to a parish in, say, Paris today, what you typically find in a Catholic parish is you see a lot of young people, you see a lot of people who are there, but not because they have to be there, but because they want to be there. So that's one side of France. On the other side, you do have, I would argue, um, uh, a lot of indifference to religious faith in general. And then you always have had, since the mid-18th century, uh, a significant quarter of France that is deeply hostile to religion per se, and Catholicism in particular. And that, I think, is a pretty good way of describing what you see in France today. A lot of people who are now very devout, who take their faith seriously, who try to live out their faith, again, whether they're Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, or whatever, Then you have a large number of people who are at best culturally associated with a particular faith. And then you have a significant group of people who are just hostile, hostile to religion per se, and particularly to the Catholic Church. And I think we will see some of these dynamics start to work their way through when the questions start to come out about how Notre Dame is going to be rebuilt. Because there are already people saying things like, well, France is very different, so therefore this building, which means so much to us, should reflect what France is now. Well, okay, but it's also true that this is and always has been a Catholic church, and that this cathedral has always been a Catholic church in the context of the history of France, And to take away its identity as a Catholic church would be to basically forget and dishonor this long history of Catholicism in France, which people, plenty of people who are not Catholic will say, of course, of course, Catholicism is part of French history. Who on earth would pretend otherwise? Do you think that France stands in a position at this moment to gain any re-inspiration of its roots from this? I think the answer to that is yes and no. On the one hand, I think those people who are religious believers will see this as an opportunity to remind other people in France of the significance of religion for French history, for French culture, for who the French are today. So that's an opportunity. On the other hand, I also think that it's it's true that France has changed in many significant ways, and large segments of French society are largely deaf to religion. And again, it's not so much which religion we're talking about, it's the whole concept of religious faith, which is alien to large numbers of French citizens today. 
So I think for those people who are believers, particularly practicing Catholics, it's an opportunity to remind people of the role that the Church has played in French history and that to, that to understand French, France, it's very difficult not to pay some attention to Catholicism. So that's maybe an opportunity for a proper discussion of French identity. But there's also going to be a lot of people who are basically indifferent to the whole thing. So yes, an opportunity, but let's not pretend that France has not undergone a significant degree of secularization over the past 200, 250 years. And by secularization, I don't just mean things like in embracing the positive aspects of modernity, of which there are many. I also mean the sense that somehow religion is in the past, religion is superstition, and we need to move away from that. Now, I'm going to read a bit of what you published in an article for First Things yesterday, and then I have one last question for you. In a piece for First Things, you told the story about when Paris was liberated from German occupation on August 25th, 1944, and General Charles de Gaulle marked the moment by visiting Notre Dame, and in front of the altar, which, by the way, is still intact, I believe, uh, chanted the Te Deum Laudamus, meaning to God we praise. You wrote that de Gaulle's presence in Notre Dame mattered because it symbolized the restoration of France's liberty and honor after four years of occupation and the disgrace of collaboration. What's more, hundreds of people inside the cathedral and the thousands gathered outside, Catholics, atheists, socialists, Jews, resistance fighters, they also understood what de Gaulle had done because they too instinctively recognized Notre Dame's importance for France. What would you emphasize should be remembered about the cathedral? The thing I would emphasize the most is to understand why it was built, who built it, and the vision that they brought to that particular activity. Because when you look at Notre Dame, what you see is something that was created by people living in a very different time to ours. These were people who were medieval people. Their conception of the world, their understanding of the relationship between the divine and the temporal, between God and us, is very different from how large numbers of Frenchmen and Europeans see the world today. So when they were building these things, it is not just obviously Notre Dame, but many other beautiful buildings in, in Europe, they weren't doing it in the sense of let's make a beautiful museum piece that people will come and visit and take pictures of. They were building it because they wanted to create a place where God could dwell. They wanted to build a place that gave honor and reflected God's creativity and the way that God has created human beings to live out the mandate in Genesis to go and create and shape the world as God intended it to be shaped. And that, I think, is what needs to be remembered. The labor, the vision of the men, and probably also women, who invested years of their lives in constructing this and many other buildings throughout Europe. Uh, that vision, of course, I think is, is what people need to understand. So I think it was the Archbishop of Paris, Michel Petit, who basically said, he said, look, you've got to remember that this is not just a pretty picture. This is not just a jewel, a sort of architectural jewel. This is a place where people believe God dwells. This is why we build these things. It's why we build beautiful buildings, because we take very seriously the mandate to keep, um, in Genesis to transform the world, but we also want to give honor to the divine. That, that I think is what people need to remember, because it's that, that labor, in, in fact, that love which they invested into this place 800 years ago and in succeeding generations as repairs were done and refurbishments and restorations were made, that's what needs to be remembered, that why this building was built and why people were so concerned that it be beautiful. That's what people need to remember. 
Sam, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks, Caroline. Always good to talk with you. In the past few decades, news from the Muslim world has raised an important question in the West. Is Islam a religion compatible with the idea of individual freedom? Islam's legal tradition includes many elements of religious coercion, supremacism, and violence. But reformist trends in Islam reinterpret religious law by referring to the moral teachings at its core. Right now, there's an intellectual battle going on in the Muslim world, where some believers condemn freedom as a Western invention, while others praise it as Allah's blessing. To hear more about this topic, join us at the Acton Institute's office in Grand Rapids, Michigan, on April 25th, to hear Mustafa Akiol, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, address Islam and freedom. Register today at acton.org slash events. Welcome. My name is Dan Huger, librarian and research associate at the Acton Institute. Today, my guest is Father Robert Sirico, co-founder and president of the Acton Institute. Father Robert and I will be discussing education, the state of American public education, the prospects for education reform, and Catholic education in his own parish school, Sacred Heart Academy. Father Robert, welcome to Acton Line, and thank you for speaking with us. Thank you. What America's had for boy, over a century now, is a system of sort of free and compulsory public education. The idea is that we educate all children at no cost to parents, and this way we integrate them to be faithful citizens, productive members of society. What's wrong with America's system? Well, I think people like me who remember this system back in the 1950s uh, forget that that system is not quite the system that we have today. For example, the – and this may surprise even some of our listeners – the Department of Education didn't come into existence until the 19 – I think it was the 1970s. Yeah. The reality is that the public education system is an example of the way in which power tends to corrupt. That were we to simply say, you could have arguments about compulsory education. Yeah. Okay, that's a separate mm -hmm. question. But were we to say there was a, a a system whereby the state would provide a modicum of money or leave a modicum of money in local communities, and that local communities and community boards, along with parents, were running that school. Mm -hmm. Uh, then that would be hard to argue with because the failure or the success would depend on that particular area. I suspect, too, that if we had that kind of system, you'd have some competition that would begin to emerge, which would only uh, tend to improve the quality of the education. The education system that I had, even in New York City mm -hmm. at that time, was largely run uh, locally, as as I began to grow up, we began to have more strikes and more bureaucratization. Yeah. So from the 20s to the 50s, it was more localized mm -hmm. than it is now. Now, we have discussions of wholesale mandates being given by Washington, D.C., two states which hand them down to schools. And I know they're going to say, no, these are just recommendations, but these are recommendations that have certain incentives and certain penalties associated with it. So overall, I think the problem occurs when we have systems, any system, mm -hmm. that removes the control from the parents and the families. That's the normative, that's the, the most, uh, I think, prudent way of providing for kids' education. Not to say that the parent needs to know every subject, mm -hmm. but the parent knows the child, generally speaking, not mm -hmm. in every instance, generally speaking, has the best interests of the child uh, at heart, certainly to a greater extent in most cases than do bureaucrats or even teachers. You know, I'm, I myself am a, a product of this sort of K through 12 American educational system, the public education system, and I had a wonderful experience. I didn't always treasure it, as children often don't at the time, but looking back on it, I had excellent teachers, teachers. 
excellent involved neighbors and parents. But I also had some experience teaching in that system. When I first got out of college, I taught English, was a public school teacher, and you're right about the federal mandates. Um, no child left behind, and particularly most recently, like, v- transform that. From what I've heard from teachers, uh, a lot of what they are preoccupied with is maintaining order in a classroom, yeah. not teaching. Mm-hmm. And that should tell us that there's something fundamentally wrong with the way in which uh, many of our children are being um, educated yeah. or not. And there's a lot of people, you know, there are still excellent public school systems in this country where that's not an issue, but we have to be aware that that is not the norm. That uh, not is... only that, but not an issue yet. Yes. And, yeah. and that's what, con- what concerns me. There was um, recently an initiative put forward by uh, Secretary of uh, Education Betsy DeVos, Senator Ted Cruz, and Representative uh, Bradley Byrne. Yes. These uh, education freedom scholarships. Right. Um, and they're designed to give parents and students more choice in education. What are your thoughts on this new initiative? I think it is a definite move in the right direction. Um, it does have the role of the states, the the local states, to initially kind of certify or determine the quality of the, the schools, but it opens a whole sphere. And what I like about it is that it's not vouchers, yeah. but that it's credits. And what I like about that is that it's not just credits to families, because some poor families frankly, don't have a lot of uh, yeah, they don't tax have credits coming to them. Around. You know, or, or even in their house. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's say you took um, a house uh, property tax and gave them the money or let them keep that money that they pay in uh, education costs, mm-hmm. uh, education taxes. Some people don't have houses. They don't mm-hmm. own houses. They live, I mean, my family, we lived in rental mm-hmm. uh, apartments or homes until I was in my teens. Uh, But this program, the uh, Proposal Education Freedom Scholarships, allows businesses also to do that. Now, that that can be very attractive because you have uh, even a city like Detroit where you'd have a lot of people who didn't own their homes, but a lot of those people are working in businesses, uh, let's say the the car industries there, who could direct uh, the money that would otherwise be requisitioned for public schools to these parents to be applied to whatever schools, public and private schools, uh, religious schools as well. And even in some instances, I, I think this uh, proposal incorporates some help for uh, homeschooling families as well. Yeah. It's really, it's really, what was interesting to me is it was focused not so much on the type or kind, or trying to micromanage the schooling and education, but seeking to just sort of like get those resources into the hands of parents and right. students to really bring out, bring the teaching and learning to the center of this equation. Now, this is occurring in the context of the transformation of the public school system that I've mm-hmm. described, where the interest now becomes the institutions particularly as safeguarded by teachers unions. Mm -hmm. Anything that's going to free up money for parents and for children will immediately bring down the wrath of the teachers unions. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you do surveys of families in inner cities, for instance, Mm -hmm. you find that there's a great interest in options, educational options, or educational freedom uh, for their children. But the teachers, administrators, and unions are very much opposed to this because they realize that this is going to introduce choice, it's going to introduce competition, uh, and it's going to weaken the, the role of the unions. And there's a way that we fund schools in this country. I remember this when I taught, and I remember this when I was a student. We had every year what were called count days. They would literally, the attendance that day, determine school funding. So we would have raffles, we would have giveaways, we would have anything to get the maximum amount of bodies in there. Because the funding levels aren't, you know, determined by the choice of the parents, the buy-in of the parents, or the commitment to the children. It's just, it's it's a it's a headcount in yeah. many cases today. It, it's exactly a headcount because the money 
Mm -hmm. uh, is there. Each child represents a certain amount of money to that school. I know that we're going to talk a little bit about my own uh, personal experience uh, with our school in my parish. Yeah. But uh, when I came to my parish, we had, uh, I believe it was three public school teachers. Mm -hmm. The state will allow, or the teachers association will allow the teachers to teach religious school students, mm -hmm. but they have to do it in a facility that is technically separate from the school. Now, in some cases, that means literally a, um, a kind of um, a trailer pulled up yeah. side, beside the school. In our case, we could have it within the school building, mm -hmm. but they, you'd have to sign um, a waiver relinquishing the authority of the pastor to approve the teacher, and an agreement that this was a rental space, the school, mm -hmm. uh, that is the public school system, was renting this room, and all religious objects needed to be removed from, so the statues or crucifix or the Ten Commandments on the wall, all of that would have to be removed from the classroom setting. Mm -hmm. And the reason they did that was to count those children as part of their count so that yeah. they still had the money. That's, that's really the reason they were coming into a uh, parochial school sitting, setting, mm -hmm. because they wanted to count our kids. They wanted, they wanted that additional leverage. When I became pastor, I ended that practice, along okay. with, by the way, the um, uh, hot lunch program. But we can talk oh, about yeah, that. Yeah. This is this is at Sacred Heart, which is the parish that you are the parish priest at. Yes. And this is uh, just uh, the Acton Institute, for those of you who don't know the geography of Grand Rapids, is on the east side of the river. And Sacred Heart and its school are on the west side of the river. The, I poor, am, the poor side. <laughs> I am also a west sider. The west side right. is the best side. I think um, so. <laughs> and uh, what can you tell us about, about that parish school and sort of what Sacred Heart Academy is doing? I guess sort of, sort of like where it was yeah. and then... Well, as you say, it's on the uh, west side of the city, which is uh, the ethnic side of the city. Mm -hmm. So uh, where I happen to be historically, that was a Polish area, uh, not exclusively, but, but predominantly Polish. There were some Irish, there were some Germans, and then there were some more Poles mm -hmm. <laughs> and a few stray Italians. And some Lithuanians. <laughs> and Lithuanians, yeah. but the Lithuanians thought they were Poles. Yeah. <laughs> the confusion of For geography. many years they yes, were. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> so this uh, school was founded in 1904, the School of the Sacred Heart, and was run like a, most Catholic schools. In fact, the school was built before the church was built. The church mm -hmm. wasn't built until 20 years later. Okay. I came to that school uh, about seven years ago, about nine, uh, 2012, 2013 became the pastor, and found 68 students in the school. It was about uh, two-thirds of the collection money that the parish received on Sundays went to the support of the school. Yeah. The goal of the diocese was 33%. We had 67, 68% of the, um, the money going there. More important than, than all of that was when I went into the school, it was moribund. You could tell, you could just feel there was a lack of energy. Mm -hmm. The physical school itself was, I'm sorry to say, not very pleasant, not... not um, well buffed. Yeah. Uh, the artwork was mediocre. The social events were secular. There was mass once a week. I realized that this thing was dying. On the way in, the bishop said to me, look, I know if you need to close the school, go ahead and close the school. This is the last school in this area of Grand Rapids, yeah. uh, what we call the Valley of the, the I had a lot of West neighbors Island. who went to that school. Yeah. No, the alumni base is incredible. We had nuns back in the day and all of that. The school itself physically, I think at one point, had something like 700 students. Mm -hmm. It was down to 68 students. Oh. And I gathered the entire parish together after I had been there for a while to see what the resources were and who the people were, and announced that we were either going to close the school or reinvent it. And I said that I wanted to reinvent the school with a different focus, mm -hmm. namely that the parents would be the prime educators of their children, mm 
and that I wanted to uh, ensure that the character of the school, the culture of the school represented the Christian tradition mm -hmm. out of which we came, the Catholic tradition. Yeah. And so the following September, I had made several decisions. First is I got a donor to donate uniforms, mm -hmm. not just for the children in the school, yeah. but for the teachers as well. So the teachers were wearing uniforms mm -hmm. with the children. Yeah. The second was to release from their contracts the public school teachers. We had, as they say, three of them mm -hmm. who were teaching because I felt I had the responsibility to approve who the teachers were, and I wanted religious symbols mm -hmm. uh, in our classrooms. I also let go of the hot lunch program, which was ostensibly designed for poor children, but was onerous in the bureaucratic requirements and the nutritional requirements that it had. The children simply didn't want to eat kale. Yeah. And the uh, dietician said to me, we buy this stuff because we're mandated to, and then we have to throw it out. And the dietitian had to attend numerous seminars, learning various bureaucratic regulations and everything. I was also afraid that uh, because the school was receiving this subsidy, that we would be required to abide by various other regulations having to do with bathrooms and, and the like. Yeah. And so I just... Um, killed that program. By the way, we saved about $60,000 the next year. Mm -hmm. So not only... Yeah. And somebody asked me, well, what are the hungry children going to do who come to the school? Who's going to feed them? And I said, well, the parents are going to feed their children. Yeah. And if anybody comes to the school and the teacher sees that they need something, then I will always have peanut butter, jelly, and tomato soup, which was my favorite yeah. uh, meal growing up. <laughs> that was the only way my parents could get me to eat peanut butter and jelly, right. was to <laughs> dip it in tomato soup. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that, and we also changed the curriculum. We changed it into what's known as a classical curriculum. Mm -hmm. And probably the easiest decision I made, but the uh, decision that was the most dramatic, and I think ultimately had the most impact, was we uh, mandated that all of the children would come to Mass every day of the week. Okay. So we have daily Mass. I think we're one of five schools in the country that have that. Yeah. Over the last seven years, with those changes in place, a number of um, uh, new teachers, because some of the legacy teachers decided to take their ret retirement options, mm -hmm. uh, a new headmaster, we went from a principal to a headmaster, uh, a number of homeschooling uh, families wanted to have their children educated there, and so we created a two-day-a-week homeschooling alternative. We call it a classical enrichment program. Yeah. With, uh, with all of that that took place over the last six years, really, we went from 68 students to now an enrollment of about 340. That's wonderful. We're going to be capping it. Pretty soon, some of the classes are oversubscribed. We have about um, no more than 18 to 20 students per classroom. Mm -hmm. Great students, I must say, graduates of Hillsdale College, a lot of them, not yeah. all of them. And um, the atmosphere, not just in the school, mm -hmm. but in the parish as a whole, has resulted in a renaissance of this very old parish in Grand yeah. Rapids that's become a whole new place to to worship. What, what's the role of, of sort of moral formation in the classroom? You're, you're forming these students academically, you're forming them, you're giving them a daily religious context. Is there anything you do um, that would be different in the realm of, you know, what a lot of people refer to as character education? Well, uh... Let me say that we don't break it in parts. I think mm -hmm. this is one of the things about classical education. It's not like we have a box to check. Okay, now we've done the academic. Now we've done the religious. Now we'll do the character. It's all of a piece. Yeah. That uh, what I find is that when kids learn things, they learn them holistically. If they're going to study a particular area of the world, they're going to study the language, the economy, the culture, the religion, the geography, uh, scientific discoveries that have emerged from that area, the whole thing at once. Mm -hmm. So 
I think, at least it's not, not come to my attention that there's been any real bullying mm-hmm. in this school. In fact, we have a number of kids who are special needs kids. And when I've seen them interacting with one another, what I detect is that the children are particularly attentive and inclusive Mm -hmm. of those kids to be involved in things, even though their abilities to do a particular game or thing uh, isn't up to what the other kids might be. Um, So that there is this reinforcing expectation Mm -hmm. of these children that the teachers model, Mm -hmm. that I as a pastor model, that the um, administration of the school and the families, so that that there's this whole interlocking thing where these kids are being formed for life. Mm -hmm. They're formed to to be apostles. They're formed to be ambassadors of Christ, to go into the world and live their faith in the world and become influential within their various professions that, mm-hmm. that, that they will choose. So it's it's not like we now children were going to sit down and have a class on character. Mm-hmm. There are these set of expectations so that it becomes a natural, integral part of who they are yeah. as human beings. The education becomes a product of, of the life of the community itself. So. It, this is what I'm seeing. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's amazing to me because I never in my... 30 years of priesthood, uh, never had a school. Mm -hmm. This is a new experience for me. And I've learned from this. I I really wish that I was 30 years younger because now I could could really hit the ground running. It's it's a shame that I've had to come to this uh, later in my, my life. Yeah. Well, we're certainly glad you did. Thank you so much for being with us today, Father Robert. Great to be with you. Thanks. It's Sacred Heart Academy, by the way, is the name of it. Sacred Heart Academy in Grand Rapids. You can find it on the web. Thank you for listening today. Our team here at Acton wouldn't be able to produce Act in Line without you. And we want to hear any feedback you have for this show. Help us make an even better podcast and email us at actinline at actin.org. Also, last but not least, don't forget to swing over to our website at actin.org slash line and subscribe to this podcast. We are on iTunes, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever you listen.